Hello and welcome and thank you for joining me. Uh, this is Paul Norell with an overview of Pendragon, the most recent of GMT Games coin series. I'd like to give a brief overview of the game with the aim of prompting viewers to explore a very intriguing period of British history through a game which is not only exciting but historically accurate and full of atmosphere. Uh, as I mentioned, Pendragon is the latest GMT release in the acclaimed coin series. The series focuses on conflicts in which rival factions compete for their own particular military and political objectives, usually in two main power blocks. But they're subdivided into smaller interest groups where two factions, um, with their own self-interests, will nonetheless be obliged to cooperate for the good of both. Now, Pendragon takes us back to 5th century Britain, uh, during a time often erroneously referred to as the Dark Ages. And I say erroneously because, well, the lights didn't suddenly go out and life continued as normal for most people. I remember as a naive schoolboy thinking that people woke up one day and seeing grey skies and thunderclouds remarked to each other, ooh, it must be the Dark Ages. Well, that's the problem with labelling, of course. And if you are interested in discovering more, there are several very interesting documentaries on YouTube which deal with the facts and dispel much of the mythology surrounding the period foremost among which, of course, is the history, folklore, and legends surrounding King Arthur. So, while, of course, no one was particularly cognizant of any sudden transition in daily life, it was nonetheless an uncertain time when the declining influence of Roman civilization, which had dominated Europe and the Mediterranean for four centuries or more, it gave way to ever-increasing incursions by barbarian tribes and the vicious battle for power between rival factions to fill the vacuum left by Roman government and culture. Now, in Pendragon, two of the factions represent the existing power groups in Britain at the turn of the 5th century AD. The Dux faction represents the Roman army and institutions still in control but about to be undermined by the Emperor Honorius's decision to withdraw all Roman forces from Britain to defend the Empire's frontiers elsewhere. This uh, occurred in the momentous year 410 AD. Now, in the game, the ducks is represented by red, crew, uh, red cubes, which represent the uh, troops, mainly cavalry, but also infantry support, and uh, forts. And their goal is to retain Roman control and military dominance. The Kiwitates are the Romanized British, who hold much of the civilian authority and run the towns and cities on Roman lines, but wanting more autonomy with the passage of time, declining Roman influence and the increasing raids and incursions by the barbarian tribes in Europe, Scotland and Ireland. Uh, I use those terms, but of course those regions didn't exist as entities at this time. And the Kiwitates are represented by dark and light blue pieces. They are the trained troops, the Comitates, and the militia, hill forts and towns. Now both these factions have their singular goals, the ducks to maintain Roman authority, the Kiwitates to supplant it with a civilian authority, and there will come a time when they will inevitably be in conflict with each other. However, at the start of the game, they need to cooperate to fend off the encroachments of the other two factions. The Saxons are the Germanic peoples who begin by launching raids along the eastern and southern coasts of Britain. And as their confidence increases and countermeasures prove less effective, they start to establish settlements and a more permanent presence in the counties now known as Norfolk, Suffolk 
Essex, Kent and Sussex. In fact, their names betray their Saxon origins. Essex, East Saxons, and Sussex, South Saxon. The Saxons exist in two forms. Raiders, represented by the irregular shaped black blocks, and war bands, which are the cubes. The former are used for hit and run raids on the coast with the occasional deep raid in land, while the latter are the more permanent formations which establish settlements and fight the locals in pitched battles. In fact, these raids became so prevalent that the coastline uh, came to be known as the Saxon Shore and had to be patrolled by warships to reduce the impact of these raids. Now, meanwhile, the opposite coastline on the west um, was being ravaged by raiders of a different calibre. These are generically referred to as the Scotty and they represent in the game the various tribes who launch land and seaborne raids from Hibernia, Ireland, and Caledonia, Scotland. They also exist in two forms, raiders and warbands, although unlike the Saxons, they're concerned rather less with establishing permanent settlements than with gaining renown from consistent raiding. Now, the very beautiful board is divided into um, regions with their original Celtic names, many of which require some linguistic acrobatics just to pronounce correctly, but historical authenticity is one of the beauties of this game. The road system allows ducks troops to move quickly to threatened areas, but with the gradual decline of centralised authority, they can fall into disuse through lack of maintenance and cease to be of any real function. Each town or village is represented by either a town or hill fort and each has a prosperity level represented by these gold cubes. These of course are the target of barbarian raids and can provide plunder after battles and sieges. There are three main terrain types which provide benefits or penalties to certain troop types for which it is designated home terrain. Uh, clear terrain um, basically means that regular troops will usually avoid being ambushed uh, while um, raiders, barbarians will find it more difficult to evade. Hill terrain provides the benefit to Scotty if ambushing or wanting to uh, evade and Fenland terrain on the uh, eastern coastline provides the benefit to Saxons who are either ambushing or wanting to evade. Um, an important feature of the board are the tracks that um, keep record of prestige, resources, renown, etc. and the holding boxes for the various uh, faction pieces. Um, I personally prefer to see the uh, holding boxes as part of the board rather than separate player mats, but I know there are different opinions on this. Most important track is the Imperium track which recalls the level of authority competed for by the Ducks and Kiwitates and it also indicates the changing conditions for victory. In the course of the game authority gradually declines from Roman control to autonomy and finally fragmentation. A feature of all coin games are the tracks which record which faction is eligible for actions and which have used their action and will miss the next turn. And these are represented by discs of the various faction colours. Now, another feature of coin games are the specialised uh, charts which each faction 
is provided with, uh, containing a series of initiatives, which are divided into commands and feats, uh, most of which require the expenditure of resources, and all of which are subject to certain conditions which only particular factions may utilize. Now, the cards, which are uh, truly a thing of beauty, are the heart of the game. Each card will have uh, a priority list for which faction can operate first, either to take um, an action or uh, play an event, which is depicted on the card and, and based on some historical circumstances. And the event will be implemented uh, in lieu of actions and or feats. Uh, in some case, the uh, conditions which the event uh, stipulates can apply to the faction uh, either just once or for the duration of the game or until the end of the next epoch round. And as a reminder, there are counters which can be used by whichever faction is employing that particular um, benefit. Uh, finally, I'd just like to mention the rule book and the playbook, which are both magnificent publications. They are copiously illustrated, uh, the playbook in particular providing a mass of historical background and explanation of all the cards, uh, not to mention various playthrough examples. There's even a section devoted to the pronunciation of Celtic names, which is a challenge all by itself. Well, I hope this brief overview has whetted your appetite. Uh, whether you enjoy the coin system, or are interested in this particular period of history, or enjoy multiplayer games with elements of both conflict and cooperation, or you just love games with beautifully designed components. This is a game you will enjoy, and I hope you will give it a try. And with GMT about to release a coin fest of its recently published games, well, what better opportunity than now to give Pendragon a try, or indeed any other game in the series? Well, thanks for watching, and I will leave you with some images which I trust will evoke the appropriate atmosphere. Bye for now. Thank you.